Good evening. Um, I'm so glad you're here. I'm Kathleen Digri. I'm a professor of neurology and ophthalmology at the University of Utah and also at the Moran Eye Center. And this is Headache School, uh, the University of Utah Department of Neurology's Headache School. It's brought to you by the Department of Neurology at the University of Utah. And it's also brought to you by the Daniel Henry Foundation uh, to help that helps also support uh, Headache School. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking about a topic that I'm very interested in, and um, I've entitled it, Why Am I Light Sensitive All the Time? And for those of you who are on this call, I hope you'll find this interesting. I'll be speaking for maybe 20 minutes or so, and then uh, we will stop recording, and then we'll all come together and you can ask any question you want, and we won't be recording the question an answer session. This will only be recording the talk for the people who can't make it tonight. So I'm going to start with a case of Mary. Uh, she's 35. She has a severe photophobia ever since a motor vehicle accident about six months ago. She's not leaving her house. She does have a previous history of migraine. And uh, when, when she uh, has a migraine, her photophobia markedly worsens. She's now wearing sunglasses all the time. She uh, has been to the eye doctor and the eye doctor said, well, you've got dry eyes, um, but didn't have anything else to do for the light sensitivity. Then she went to a neurologist who said, well, you've got migraine and you've got depression and anxiety. And Mary says to me, this is really getting me down. I can't leave my house. How am I going to live? Why am I so light sensitive? What is wrong with me? So this term photophobia, uh, photo means kind of light uh, and phobia means a fear, a fear of light. We've used the term to mean light sensitivity. And uh, many years ago, uh, people thought, said that it was really the exposure to light that induces and exacerbates pain. And many other people have come up with other terms like photooculodynia, meaning that light causes pain in the eye when it shouldn't be causing the pain. Or photodynia, meaning that the light causes pain when it shouldn't be causing pain. Or photoallodynia, meaning the light is causing pain elsewhere too when it shouldn't be covering, causing any pain. But really, what it really boils down to, this is a pain and discomfort in the eye that comes from not a usually painful light source. Now there's different types of photophobia. There's episodic photophobia. That means people, let's say, who have migraine, who get light sensitive just with their migraine. Okay. Then there's chronic photophobia, which means that they are sensitive all the time. And people who have this sometimes have migraine. Sometimes they have a blinking disorder called blepharospasm. Sometimes they have dry eyes and sometimes they have brain injury. For such a common symptom, so little is really known. All of us have a threshold. Think about the last time you went to a matinee. You went to the matinee, you sat in the movie, you come out into a bright light and you go, whoa. Well, some people have even lower thresholds. And that happens when you have a sensitive brain. For example, people who have migraine have sensitive brains and lights are always maybe a little bit more intense and blepharospasm or depression. What I think is interesting that light itself can even lower other pain thresholds. In other words, if you're predisposed, light can change how you perceive pain, let's say in your hand or arm or whatever. And what's also interesting is that there's seasonal variation. That means that you can be more light sensitive in the winter and less light sensitive in the summer. Now this big chart has not every cause, but almost every cause of photophobia that you can imagine. And I'm going to, with my arrow point out that some of it comes from inflammation in the eye. And that's why people with light sensitivity often go to their eye doctors to see, look at the, in, the uh, eyeball. To, uh, on, the, on the cornea. Um, some people uh, have 
inflammation behind the eye. In other words, they have to look inside the eye to see an inflammatory problem. But there are brain causes of photophobia. For example, people who have meningitis get very bad photophobia. People who have pituitary tumors have bad photophobia. Um, some psychiatric conditions like depression can have an increased amount of light sensitivity. And then there's a whole host of other things. For example, um, fibromyalgia and other things. But the most common conditions that cause chronic light sensitivity are migraine, very most common, blepharospasm, which we can talk about, and traumatic brain injuries. About 50 to 75% of people who've had some kind of trauma to their head may have chronic light sensitivity. What's also interesting is it's much more common in women than in men. And in this study, we looked at a bunch of men and women who came to our clinic. And the, and the most common causes were migraine, dry eyes, which actually affected both men and women, and trauma, uh, head trauma was more common in men than in, in women. Now, let's just talk about migraine and photophobia to start with. Uh, so in normal light, you should not be light sensitive. But when you have a migraine, if you're in the beginning of a migraine, you might be like this woman right here with a pillow over her head because the light is driving her crazy as well as her two kids. And uh, it's a major diagnostic criteria for migraine. Light sensitivity is part and parcel with migraine. And researchers have found it's the most bothersome symptom in migraine. And if you took everybody with light sensitivity, most of these people are going to have migraine. It's, it's the most common cause of photophobia. Now let's talk about dry eyes. And I don't want to give you a big anatomy lesson, but I think it's important to understand how the eye is connected to the migraine center, OK? Dry eyes are very common. And as we get older, dry eyes become even more common. For example, in younger age group, maybe only 4% of women have dry eyes. But if you're over 50, 11% have, have dry eyes. And, and if you look at the eye, the eye is innervated. That means that the sensory information that comes to the eye is comes from what we call V1 or the trigeminal system. The V1 of the trigeminal system. And look at all those little nerves going there. Well, this nerve supplies the cornea with the tiniest itty bittiest nerves. So if your eye is dry, those little trigeminal endings that are sitting on the cornea are going to send a signal back through that nerve into the brainstem, and it's going to connect to this nucleus, the trigeminal cervical complex. And this is kind of what we call the migraine center. OK? So you're going to get a direct communication into the migraine center. So dry eyes can make migraine worse. And people with lots of migraines sometimes even have dry eyes. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. Normally, if, you're nor normally, if you've got a dry eye, it sends that signal. It tells the autonomic nervous system. This is the system that does stuff. You don't have to think about it. It's doing its stuff for you. And there's nuclei there in your brainstem that send a signal all the way to your lacrimal gland to produce tears, OK? And, and so that normal feedback is that this trigeminal system comes in, communicates with your little tear center, and sends more tears. But it often in dry eye, this communication doesn't work very well. Either the autonomic system isn't working well, or the communication system isn't working well. And so this is why dry eyes can stimulate the migraine center and connect to migraine. Now, blepharospasm is a movement disorder. It is involuntary blinking. And often people will start with a little dry eyes, and then they start blinking more and more. And then they get more, blink even more and more. And then they squeeze. Their eyes start squeezing down. And photophobia is present in at least 80% of the people who have this disorder. Uh, light increases that blink rate as well. And then traumatic brain injury. OK, so if somebody gets an injury, a traumatic brain injury from sports, let's say, 
or, or let's say a motor vehicle accident or some other trauma concussion, um, about 50 to 75% of people can have light sensitivity. Often the men get it more than women. Men have more head injuries than women. And it often leads to a headache that resembles migraine. And it's often very difficult to treat. So now we've talked about migraine, blepharospasm, dry eyes, and traumatic brain injury as the most common causes of light sensitivity. Our patient has underlying migraine, dry eyes, and a history of this head injury. So she says to me, okay, I've got chronic light sensitivity. Why do I have it? So you're, you're telling me I've got migraine, dry eyes, and so why, why is this occurring? So how do you get light sensitivity from a normal light source? Do you need vision? And the answer is no. We've done studies where people had just bare light perception. That means they could not see. They couldn't read. They couldn't see TV. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't see. And when they had their migraine, they were light sensitive. To understand why that could happen to somebody, we have to look at a special cell that lives in our retinas called the melanopsin cell or the intrinsically photoactive retinal ganglion cell. And I don't want to bore you with anatomy again, but I think it's important to understand that this is all physiologic. All this stuff is happening in your eyes and brain. So the cones that deliver our vision uh, go to ganglion cells. But there's a special ganglion cell called the melanopsin cell. And this cell is very old, like frogs have them. So amphibians had it, dinosaurs had it. Okay, these are old, old, old cells in, in our creation. And they go to the centers that control circadian rhythm. That means they go to centers that help us know when to sleep, when to wake up, and what's going on. They go to centers that release melatonin to help us sleep. They go to centers that make our pupils work. They go to centers that work with images as well. So you don't have to be blind to be light sensitive. And they go to a center that connects with the trigeminal system and uh, in migraine. And so we think this cell is at least in part responsible for light sensitivity because look at what happens with this. If I turn the lights on, this cell takes a long time to get going. But once it gets going, it fires and fires and fires and fires and fires. I turn the light off. It's still firing and firing and firing. It takes forever to turn itself off. So it's a cell that kind of just is slow to turn on. But once it gets going, it's really, really strong. And then um, it has the peculiar wavelength um, in the blue-green wavelength. It's about 480 nanometers. So it's kind of in a special little spot of uh, blue-green light. All right, so Mary says to me, okay, I get it. My light sensitivity center got turned on. Am I crazy? Why did they say I was depressed and anxious? So let me tell you what I told Mary. So many people who have light sensitivity put their sunglasses on because it feels so good. But when uh, the, the, these are true papers. These are papers that were written. The sunglasses sign predicts non-organic visual loss, meaning that when people wear them into the office, many times they've got visual loss that is not physiologic. It's not uh, caused by anything. And then this was in an editorial that said psychogenic, meaning psychological photophobia, may be a specific phobia, an emotionally aversive reaction to visual stimuli. Unlike those with organic illnesses, meaning real illness, people go to incredible lengths to avoid light exposure, withdraw from outdoor activities, dim all the lights in the house, draw the window blinds, and wear several layers of sunglasses. Now, this is one of the problems that this sign, people wearing sunglasses inside, has kind of been interpreted as having a little bit of craziness to it, okay? And But that isn't really the deal. I mean, I know people wear sunglasses because it makes them feel better when they're exposed to bright light. But I want you to understand uh, 
why people with photophobia, chronic photophobia, get depression and anxiety. There is an emotional component. And what we did was we took individuals with episodic migraine, with episodic photophobia, and people with chronic migraine, okay? And, and people who had photophobia all the time. They were photophobic every single day. And we did a photophobia score, and we had people who were not photophobic, didn't have migraine or anything. And we found out that the people who were light sensitive had a big high score. Well, that's good. That means our scoring system worked. But here was interesting. We did a depression screen and found that people who had light sensitivity all the time had a high depression score, higher than people who didn't have continuous photophobia and controls. In fact, the people who had only episodic light sensitivity were the same amount of depression as controls. And we did the same thing with an anxiety scale and found that the anxiety was elevated as all as well. And normals and non-light sensitive people did not have anxiety. Now here's what I think is interesting is animal studies help us understand that there, this component is real. So if you take blind, newborn mice, all mice that are born before postnatal day nine, so they get born nine days before, before they start to see anything. The only cells that are working are those melanopsin cells. That's the only thing that's working. Otherwise, they are truly blind mice. You know, we talk about three blind mice, okay? They're truly blind at birth. So a researcher shined light on these blind mice. And these little mice made all kinds of little distress noises, just the same thing as they, if you took them away from their mom or the litter or you, you know, poked their tail or something, it made these uh, little squeaky noises and they were in distress. They knocked out that melanopsin cell, that cell that detected light, and you shine the light on the mice and they didn't do anything. Then they took the brains of the mice and cut them up and said, what part of the brain is involved? Well, they found this little light sensitivity center, the posterior thalamus, and they saw activation of a part of the brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala is part of our limbic system. It's part of our emotional system. Our brains have an emotional brain inside them, okay? Um, and and you, you don't really have, you have some control over that emotional brain, but sometimes you really don't have much control over it. So if you activate this pathway, the emotional center of the brain becomes involved. So depression and anxiety are part of what happens when somebody has chronic light sensitivity. Not everybody, but most people. So it tells you that the emotional side of this is actually taking place in the brain and it's being caused by this unusual light sensitivity and all the connections that are involved in it. So this made um, us, we wrote this article several years ago, say that there are circuits in the brain that are involved in eye pain and light sensitivity. The eyeball is gonna be connected to the pain centers, the trigeminal centers. They connect to that melanopsin center and all these other centers come together and all of them go to the limbic system uh, or the, the emotional system of the brain. So I want you to realize that there's a real circuit, there's a real pathway that this happens. People aren't making this stuff up. This is a real deal. And uh, so this diagram uh, came from my book on case-based eye pain. So we want to stress that the dry eye, which stimulates the trigeminal center in the cornea, migraine, which stimulates the uh, migraine center, and head injury all come together to give this shared uh, light sensitivity experience. Um, and it can be mediated by a chemical called calcitonin gene-related peptide, peptide, also known as CGRP, which is released by that trigeminal center, the pain center that feeds our head and our face and our and the covering of our brain. All right, so Mary says to me, thank you. 
now I know what I have. I know why I have it. But can't you do something to help me? So how do we treat eye pain and light sensitivity, especially the light sensitivity? The, my number one thing is you have to understand why you have it. You have to understand why depression and anxiety can occur with this. You have to know what is the leading cause. Is it mostly migraine? Is it dry eyes? Is it that brain injury? Or is it all three of them have come together to cause this to occur? Then the next thing is really hard for some people. If you live in the dark, then light is going to bother you even more. So I say those in the dark need to slowly come into the light. Because if you're dark adapted all the time, that means you are, you, you're, even the littlest light is going to drive you crazy. So you just have to get used to it. You know when you hurt your knee or your thumb or you hit something, what do you do? You, you rub it. Well, does that make sense when you hit something? But you see what it does is it changes the situation. And that's what getting into the light also does is it starts to change the perception of the amount of light and actually can help people get better into the light. Then if dry eye is a component, then we recommend preservative free tears. You can go to your pharmacy. You can use these every hour, every two hours. When you're at the computer, you may need to use them a lot because we don't blink as much when we're at the computer. Sometimes we recommend omega-3 oils because that seems to be helpful. I'll show you some devices that can increase tear production and also may be helpful for the pain. If you have underlying migraine, then you need to prevent the migraine from occurring and you need to be able to treat the acute migraine when you have it. And then we have to deal with this emotional brain part and treat the depression and anxiety because that part can be deadly. Photophobia and migraine don't kill people, but depression and anxiety kill people every single day. So what are some treatments that we've found to be successful for people with chronic light sensitivity? Um, Dr. Katz that I work with uh, uh, wrote a paper about using onobotulinum toxin or Botox as some people know it. Um, and, and you do it in a typical pattern of migraine and just for the light sensitivity and for some people they get a lot better. There are reports that uh, anticonvulsants like gabapentin and pregabalin are very helpful for people who have chronic light sensitivity, even if it's caused by dry eyes. Anecdotally, anecdotally means some people have said that the CGRP monoclonal antibodies may be helpful for some people. Men melatonin helping with any sleep disorder can be helpful. And then consider an anti-anxiety medication and I always think that it wouldn't hurt to get cognitive behavioral therapy. Finding a therapist who's really good at helping people control their environment, but also helping them control their response to the light. And I didn't really talk about the sympathetic nervous system, but sometimes blocking the sympathetic nervous system can also help with the chronic light sensitivity. We have uh, been using FL41 for a long time. This uh, tinted lens was first used in orphanages in England, um, and it was reported way back when, 1991. And it's kind of a pinkish tint, but it blocks kind of a blue-green light, a specific wavelength of light. And I've just shown you where it blocks that wavelength of light. And um, uh, you, it's, it, you can get this tint uh, at many optical shops, but you have to be careful because some places don't test their tint to make sure it's blocking the correct wavelength, which is that 480 uh, uh, wavelength. So um, be sure to ask. Moran Eye Center uh, makes, makes this. I don't make any money off of FL41, so I can tell you to go there. They make this tint up, and um, we have people from all over the world that come to the Moran Eye Center to get this lens uh, because they do make it up the right way. But many other places do too. There are some devices on the market. This is a new one called True Tear. It's something you put up your nose and it stimulates uh, tears to help with dry eyes. I have no experience with this, but uh, some people find it helpful. There are cases in the literature where using TENS units on your, uh, on your forehead, on the side of your head to be helpful. 
And then there's a super stimulator, sometimes known as a cephaly device, has also been reported to be helpful for light sensitivity um, and photophobia. So I hope that you realize that light sensitivity is a common Anybody who has it has a reason to have it. It's not something you're just making up out of the blue. The most common cause is a dry eye, over spasm, and traumatic brain injury. It has a real anatomic pathway. It's part of what's going on in the brain. This is a circuit disorder in the brain. And we really need to see this more. We need to understand the role of the melanopsin and other pathways and how that all works together with the trigeminal or pain system uh, in our brain. The cornea and dry eye symptoms can contribute to this. So it's really important that if you have dry eye, you get it treated because it's very benign treatment. And we have to accept that there's an emotional component that really needs to be considered and also treated. So this is really, really important. And above all, we need to keep working to find treatments to help with this symptom. Um, um, many of the research, research we've done on this has been with our medical students, our residents, our fellows, my colleagues here at the University of Utah, my colleagues at the University of Zurich. And we've had, we're very lucky that we've had some uh, funding um, uh, uh, to help support uh, some of the work that we've been doing. And with that, I'm going to close Stop sharing my screen.